Hi, and welcome. I'm Steve Martorano, and this is The Behavioral Corner. You're invited to hang with us as we discuss the ways we live today, the choices we make, the things we do, and how they affect our health and well-being. So you're on the corner, The Behavioral Corner. Please, hang around a while. Hi, everybody. Welcome to The Behavioral Corner. It's me, Steve Martorano, um, hanging on the corner. You know what we do here, I hope, by now. We talk about everything because everything is what affects our behavioral health. It's all uh, made possible by our uh, underwriting partners, Retreat Behavioral Health, and you'll hear more about them a little bit later down the road. we got an interesting uh, topic, and I dare say first time we've ever touched upon it. It's something we all do. Lying. We all lie. If you run into somebody who tells you they've never lied, they're probably lying. Um, so what's so interesting about this? Well, for most of us, there are reasons why we lie. We lie to a- avoid responsibility. We, we we lie to make ourselves look a little better, maybe uh, in a tough situation. We lie very often to uh, uh, save uh, people's feelings from hurting their feelings. So, you know, there's plenty of reasons why people do lies. But what happens when you lie... Uh, for no apparent reason. And the lies are grandiose and elaborate um, and devastating because, as you know, they usually catch up to us sooner or later. Our guest is um, living proof of that. Uh, Christopher uh, Christopher Massimine um, had his house of cards of lies, I should say, come tumbling down upon him about 15 months ago resulting in a, you know, a devastating situation in his life. Um, he, he is what's referred to in some quarters as a pathological or compulsive liar. And as I said, 15 months ago, the whole thing caught up with him. We're going to hear, uh, we're going to hear Christopher's story right now. Hi, Chris. Hey, Steve. How are you? Th- thanks for joining us in the middle of the, the, the hectic season for you. Um, so I get pretty much that, uh, that pretty much right. I mean, we do all lie, but, yeah. They're usually white lies, and they're usually understandable, even if they're still lies, right? Right. right. Your situation was a little bit different, um, and it didn't just start. You, you now, through reflection and tr- and, uh, and therapy, uh, recognize that you've had a problem with telling the truth since you were, well, how old? Um, second grade. It was uh, second grade, and I remember it uh, quite clearly. I actually started to, to write a little bit about these experiences. Um, it's been a little helpful and cathartic and just kind of uh, seeing the words on paper and just kind of uh, reliving it more in a, a method, methodological, I guess, yeah. kind of yeah. um, perspective. So it's, it's interesting. I've never, I've never, what, uh, what struck me about the article I read in the New York Times was that, you know, I mean, it's certainly a problem not being able to tell the truth um, or, or wishing to tell the truth, but From what I understand, there are now people in the psychiatric field, in the clinical field, who think that, well, perhaps what we're dealing with here is not somebody who just lies, but someone who is uh, lying compulsively for psychological uh, problems as as a coping mechanism. In other words, maybe this sort of lying is pathological or disease based. Right. Now, you've come to. You've come to that conclusion yourself, I guess, right? Yeah, I mean, it's um, so I, I've got a, a couple of disorders. I've, I've got major depressive disorder. Uh, I have PTSD. And then, of course, uh, the cluster B personality where the lying is um, part of that. But um, obviously, through the research that's happening now, trying to change the DSM, um, it, it does feel apparent that the lying can be its, its own thing uh, that stands very much uh, solo. Uh, it, it's been hard kind of reconciling some of the things within the um, the cluster B personality and not everything fits. And I think that's why they kind of group a bunch of things together and say, okay, you have cluster B personality. But the um, the lying has always kind of been, like you had put it, a coping mechanism. And, and really, as it grew over time, it just became more and more compulsive, more and more addiction-like, where it's, it's been something that's kind of controlled my life, whether I, I wanted to or not, whether yeah, it was yeah. coping or not. Uh, but uh, as as some of these folks put in the, the article, it's um, 
and as Ellen, I guess, narrating the article, you know, people think of uh, people who have issues with lying and immediately they go to this dark place where there's somebody who's manipulative and uh, maybe has a, a little more ill intent. And that just never really was the case with me. Um, no, no. Yeah, the most damage you did, from what I understand, is to yourself. Obviously, oh, your, yeah. your family is collateral damage, but you you were lying with no apparent benefit to you, except um, perhaps to maybe just pump your resume up a little. That's when the start, the problem began. But resume embellishment is not by itself a sign of any you know illness or sickness. People do it routinely. Let's well, unpack. and the irony the irony yeah, with that too is um, actually there was very little that was made up on my resume. It was um, basically the six months following my uh, previous to my resignation where I really, um, really lost it. Um, we were in the hiring freeze at the university of Utah. I was literally working six full-time jobs. There were people who left who I couldn't replace. And I started to pay for these pay for play articles. And that's where a lot of that came up. But, um, oh, really the, the main thing that was on my resume that was inaccurate was the master's degree, which I actually thought in earnest I had completed or i wouldn't have wrapped up that year i would have spent another year to get it now so your your was, uh your background was in uh, was in uh, theater that's you'd reached a pretty high uh position you were managing director of a, a theater company in salt lake city when when all of this uh began to come apart for you let's unpack a little bit about what you talked about sure. uh, a cluster b type personality what is that? Tell us what that is. Sure. So, so, so basically, it's um, a, a series of, um, I, I guess you could call it mental mental disorders that are put together. Um, what probably re resonates maybe most with me within that is the narcissistic personality disorder. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, when people think of narcissists, they think of people who are trying to do this maliciously. Uh, really, kind of for someone like me, it's it's because self esteem didn't really exist on its own, and so you know, pumping myself up uh, made me feel better. Because uh, I didn't know how to deal with it really any other way. I came from uh, a, a broken kind of family that was always on the cusp of divorce, uh, physically and verbally abusive. Uh, it was a really tough time kind of growing up and, and very hard on me for my academics. Like I was, um, I graduated with something like in high school and 102 average because the honors classes gave you extra points. And it's like, you know, when this all started in second grade, I had got my very first B plus and it was in math. And math was like the one place, particularly, I shouldn't have gotten a B plus because my father was an accountant. Uh, his father was an accountant and truly tracing our lineage back as far as we could. Um, I forget the, the name, but it was like in, in Rome. And he was an accountant, basically, to like the Caesar, like seriously. So it's like, well, I have to take your word for that. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> OK, anyway. OK, so I understand that. You know, as you be, be, begun to get a, a better grip on why you were behaving like this, um, professionals that you've seen have diagnosed you as well. You you, you suffer from PS, from post traumatic stress, your depressive personality, you have narcissistic tendencies. Um, let's separate you from the malicious liar. We, we, we all have plenty of experience in that lately. Um, to what you're what you're engaged in, which is self destructive lying. It doesn't seem to be associated with anything. Now, pathological is, we all are familiar with that term, pathological liar. It, we usually throw it out be, and we don't know what we're talking about. What we mean is somebody who lies a lot. But what it actually means is a sick, a diseased-based activity. You're doing this because you're diseased. The problem, as I understand it so far in the, in the, cl in the uh, clinical area, is that it is not yet in the... You said the DSM, that is the manual of mental disorders. If it's in there, then it's really an ailment. <laughs> Sometimes they can take them out of there and they're no longer ailments. But if it's not in there, it cannot be diagnosed. And I guess, in effect, it can't really be treated. So we're on the cusp of whether they'll put the type of lying you exhibit as, a, uh, as an actual mental disorder. But right now, that's what's going on. Now, I know that you have run into people that you've told that that story to. Well, I, I may be suffering from a mental illness and they and they would look at you and go, no, you're just lying. Right. Yeah, right? I mean, that that happens frequently. Um, it, it, it even, you know, moving 
even a little bit previous previous to like the lying situation, like the cluster B personality disorder and and narcissism. Like people don't even uh, recognize that that is uh, a mental disorder, and that's it's fascinating to me. It, it's made me really want to kind of take a, a heavy stand and like help educate people that actually a lot of these things that we consider bad behavior aren't necessarily bad behavior. They're things out of people's control Mm -hmm. and people like me really want to fix that because like you said, it's, it's been a destructive force in my life. Like really no good has come of this. No, no. Uh, Do you struggle right now? Do you struggle? Did you struggle today? Let's say with, with not lying. I do. It's getting better. I don't know if it will ever go away. Um, I, as, as far as I consider it, um, it, it's been at least 16 weeks uh, since I've, I've told my last lie. And that, that's something my, my therapist jokes with me about. She says, you know, you're bound to lie eventually. Lying is something we all do. It's something innate. It's, it's, it's natural within us because we had our fight or flight defense. And, you know, that's kind of where, where we're at with that. Just, do it pro productively. If you're going to do it, do it to cause somebody um, comfort or do something, you know, sure. not grandiose. As she put it, don't invent another element on the periodic table. <laughs> yes. Well, you didn't do that, did you? No. Okay. No. Um, oh, yeah. I only asked because uh, reading the description of some of the things you've lied about, um, I was struck by a couple of things. One, how, how just ridiculous some of these lies are. Oh, yeah. And secondly, why you missed your calling, you should have been a, uh, a fiction writer. I mean, you, you lied about climbing Mount Everest. I did. Uh, you, you lied about having an affair with one of the Kardashians. Yes. Um, you, you lied about uh, attending bur- the burning. I don't know why anyone would lie about attending the Burning Man uh, festival in the desert, but yeah. you did. And, and you did this to your wife. I mean, you, you told, you told yeah. your wife you were supposed to be someplace else on a business trip that you had scaled Everest. Did you really think you were going to get away with that line? No. I, I, I mean, I, again, it's one of those things where it was, and actually this one wasn't a business trip. This was, um, this was like, a, I was supposed to get away and just kind of decompress from um, ah. stressors that were going on in life. But um, no, and I only, I mean, I, I do know why I did it because I was determined to do it. And to do I what? Why? To lie about climbing Everest? No, 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 climb to, to climb Everest. And I, I couldn't get the pieces in place at the time. And I felt like I was, you know, I had told people I was doing it. And then I kind of decided to commit to doing it, even though I didn't do it, which was completely absurd. And no, I, I ultimately, that, that's the danger with these lies in general is, you know, that they're not going to come through. You know that they're going to bite you in the butt at the end of the day but you can't stop doing them. And Why that's, you tell, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's the compulsion thing. The, the compulsion thing is interesting too, because the more we talk about this with one-on-one, you and I, the, the closer it resembles the addiction model and the addiction model is still struggles. Even after all this time, even with all the medicine and all the science that's been a, a directed towards the problem of substance abuse disorders that are a medical problem, they're not a criminal justice problem. They're not a character flaw. This is brain chemistry. Yeah. Even given all of that research and evidence, you still have people will go, nobody forces them to do drugs. Nobody right. forces them to drink. It's a choice. So now we're talking about something, uh, as I say, as so, you know, so ordinary. So every day it's lying. And you're going to, you're trying to tell a lot of people that it's a disorder. You have a disorder. Their instinct is, no, you don't. I don't believe that. I think it's a, I think it's a choice you're making. I only point out a couple of these, these uh, stories you made up, these lies, because of the spectacular nature of them. In your head, when you told your wife you were having an affair with, with I don't know which Kardashian, it hardly right. matters. Uh, what did you think you were going to accomplish with that? Make her jealous or what? What did you think you were going to do? No. So um, at that time, uh, work was increasingly stressful. And something else I deal with is extreme workaholism. Like I will be at work five days in a row with very little sleep if, if I need to accomplish a goal. Like one of the areas where I, I, I wasn't really lying uh, 
until that spilled over in Utah was work. And um, in my mind, I couldn't reconcile keeping a relationship together while pursuing what I was pursuing uh, at the beginning. This was at the beginning of Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish, which was a, a very big undertaking for us. Uh, the company really wasn't ready to do it. It wasn't really aptly staffed. Uh, you know, I, I tried to make my cases to the board and to my partner there. And at, at the end of the day, um, we knew we had to go forward with it. So even though we weren't ready, we went forward with it. And of course, that took an enormous toll on me um, mentally, physically. I was sick. I have um, my immune system isn't great to begin with. So I'm, I get sick frequently, but um, yeah, I was, um, I wanted to kind of softly push my wife away and have her come to the decision that softly, you know, softly push her away by telling you were having an, an affair with. Well, and well, that it, it starts with one thing that that's the problem with it. And, you know, it, it's okay. You know, maybe I just have the conversation that I'm, I'm not, I, I can't do both and I can't figure it out, which of course is ridiculous. Obviously my priorities were wrong, but it became, you know, an affair with the Kardashian. It became hiring voice actors. It became uh, emails from different email accounts that could look like they were uh, legit and verified all kind of just so my wife could say it's over, which is ridiculous because in hindsight, my wife has really only been the person who's standing beside me throughout this whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, here's what's interesting. Um, all that effort to push your wife away from you could have been accomplished much, much easier yeah. than without the benefit of a single lie. That's right. To say, we're done. You got to get out of here. Uh, I don't want to be with you anymore. Right. It's the fiction. It's your need to make it elaborate and uh, Byzantine. I mean, really, Kim Kardashian. Um, what's that about? What, 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 what are you learning about why your mind works that way? You know, it's, I'm, I'm still learning. <laughs> and I'm still trying to figure out why I do that. But I think in, in many ways it traces back to my childhood and just the, I guess, the, what would you call it? the expectation maybe of excellence from my parents to me. And mm -hmm. like, like I said, you know, this all started off because of a B plus on a, on a math test or quiz that ultimately didn't change the fact that I got an A in math that semester anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but my parents always wanted bigger, better, grander things from me, you mm -hmm. know, and like things weren't good enough. If I, um, one time I was one, uh, one of several people who, um, and this was before this started in second grade, um, won an art competition through school. Like there were five of us or something like that. And like, that wasn't good enough. And it's like, nothing was really, no matter what I did, there was Run never enough. an enough. Yeah. 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 Uh, our guest is uh, Christopher Massamine. He uh, was a subject of an article in the New York times. He's written, a piece is now about his compulsive lying, which about 15 or 16 months ago, um, well, brought down his, his professional and, and private life and almost wrecked his marriage. His wife stood by you. I would have, I would love to talk to her. Maybe at some point she can come and at some other show and talk, talk about how she got through this. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I am struck by uh, a couple of things. You seem to be able now to, um, not assign blame, but cause. You see, you seem to be able to go, well, when I was a kid, this happened. Or when I was younger, my parents behaved this way. Or when I became an adult, I was a workaholic. When we lie to other people, it's one thing. But we probably lie to ourselves way more often, but we call it rationalization. Or we call it denial. But we're really lying to ourselves. Yeah. Are you worried that you're lying to yourself about why you lied? Uh, I, I could be, you know, I mean, I think lied, it was your, so. you think it was your parents. Do you think it was your parents, your reaction to the way your parents treat, treated you that really caused this? Really? I, I ultimately don't know to don't tell know. the truth. I don't mean, know. and that's something I've been, 
I've been separating, you know, the earliest account, you know, the first time I lied that I know for sure was in second grade. And I don't recall lying spectacularly, you know, or really lying before that because I, I get punished terribly for doing sure. that. But, it's, interesting uh, that, it's interesting that you remember the first lie. I don't think most people would remember the moment they lie. It took, it took work. Uh, yeah, it took yeah. a lot of work and, and therapy to get there, which has been helpful. But what I was going to say is I've been lying for so long about so many things that one of, I, I feel like it's a, it's a bit of a tragedy for me is there are things that may be real and they may not be real in my past because I've been so committed to those lies. And that's been, been devastating. Like, like one of them, you know, I, I thought I was a Broadway actor growing up as a kid. I have these very, very intense memories of things, both good and bad in that space. But I don't know if that's just because I've convinced myself that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And there's no real. So um, we we had a, a, a moving theft incident when we left Utah and we, we don't really have any of our, our stuff anymore. So um, I, I really have no way of like going back into the past now and not just tracing that, but anything. And that's really kind of tough for me because I'm well, not sure what's fact and fiction in some cases. Well, yeah, what you made up in your head and convinced yourself was the truth when it wasn't, yeah. while you were telling other people, you know, outrageous falsehoods. Let me ask you, uh, are you getting, what kind of treatment are you getting now? Can I ask, are you in, do you see a psychiatrist or? Yeah, so, um, I, I see uh, a therapist once a mm -hmm. week. I I, um, I do see a medicine provider as well. Uh, we work on a lot with in, in therapy. Uh, so you are being treated. You are being treated uh, treated with uh, medication as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, yeah. Um, well, but the medication is mostly um, for the um, the mood disorders, the personality right. there's no, stuff. There's there's right. no truth. There's no truth. Uh, there's no truth serum out there to force you. That's think. right. Let me ask you about the act of lying. And again, I, I again, uh, your lies are. Uh, listen, in the world of lying, you're 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 world class. You there's no two ways to, to put it. You were really good. I mean, you created a humanitarian award and then yeah. flew to New York to accept it, and nothing existed. The award didn't exist. The organization didn't exist. New York City, the last time I checked, did exist. So, but your lies are, were uh, were spectacular. Did you, when you were lying, I, I've asked this of addicts, by the way, when you were using, did you enjoy it? And for the most part, they said, yeah, they liked being high. They, for, so, for the lies? They liked being high, the way it made them feel. And then, of course, when, once you lose control of it, it be, it'll either kill you or you'll get clean. But they, the honest ones will say, and most of them have said this, when I was using, I enjoyed being high. That's why they go to the lengths they do to, be, to get drugs and be high, because it feels good. Do you remember? Can you remember what it felt like to lie? Did it make you feel good? Or did you, most people yeah. who lie, oh, here's what I, most people who lie worry they're going to get caught. So, so there's no joy in lying for, for regular folk, but if right. you, you have a disease. Did you feel good when you lied? At first, yeah. I mean, it was like I like I had mentioned that was kind of my coping mechanism. That was something that made me feel better and buoyed myself. You know, like it was kind of like, oh, here's the escape from this, or here's the um, maybe escape isn't the the right word, but here's the um, here's the counter reality to what well, yeah. what I really mean, is, and that you know, feels fantastic. Chris, for a I second, gotta say, though, I, I got to interrupt you for a second because the sun has moved directly behind you. Can you see your, no, you can't see yourself. Oh, oh, and yes. it's built, no, it's yeah. brilliant. It's like a light is shining over you, but I can't right. see your face. Yeah. If you can move to the right or left. Absolutely. Bit, there, me, you, there you go. Me, that's perfect. Let me do that. that. That's perfect. There we go. That's perfect. So, so, well, you, I called it a coping mes mechanism, you know, uh, drugs and alcohol uh, for people in crisis. is also a uh, self-medicated. Yes. Do you think your lies were a way of self-medicating? I think so. I mean, my, my parents, and this isn't pointing blame. This was just, I guess, maybe the generation was different and the times were different. Didn't really believe in um, therapy and things like that, which was ironic because when I was little, they took me to therapists a couple of times and they, they said, like, we think there could be more to this, but they didn't like the idea that I could have, you know, mental disorders. 
you know, that was stuff they would. Why did they take you to a, a child psychologist? What, because of your, because of lying? Because of, um, because of the lying. Um, I, I was always kind of depressed and sad, uh, but you know, I didn't really have a positive growing yeah. up experience. So you have siblings. Was, one more time. You have siblings. I don't. I, I grew up alone. Yeah, yeah. So I grew up alone in in in, in many ways. So it was, um, you know, I, I think them taking me to these uh, these psychiatrists and psychologists and all these clinicians was kind of like their attempt to say, no, Chris is the problem. Yeah, right. Because, it's not us. Right, it's yeah. not us. It's got to be him. Right. Um, so let uh, let me ask you what has happened as a result of the lies catching up to you, as lies always will. Yes. Uh, and 15 months ago, everything comes apart. You lose, you lose jobs, uh, you're devastated, struggling to find out what's wrong. Uh, make your way back through, you know, through therapy, and then acceptance that maybe this is a uh, mental disorder. And then a New York Times article appears. You write a piece for, I guess, Newsweek. Was it News yeah. Newsweek yeah. or Newsday? On Newsweek. Long Island. Yeah, a Newsweek. big, big, a big, 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 big article. Um, what's that done? to your way, your prospects for employment and, uh, and to your, to your social life, your world. I mean, honestly, when, when everything happened and um, my wife and I decided for me to kind of come out and say, okay, I have disorders. I've been struggling with stuff uh, that probably hit worse than anything. Any of the reporting previously had, because as you earlier had mentioned too, you know, there's kind of like, you hadn't said it this way, but there's this stigma with mental illness, where if you go out there and you start talking about it, it's it's not really understood yet. It's not really accepted in a great way by society. I think we're starting to have the conversations. But, um, you know, when that happened, it was all of a sudden, oh, and he's got this settlement and he's used that. The settlement's like, no, they, they bought me out of my contract. There it wasn't nothing there, to do with my mental illness. Uh, at so, all. People, so people understand when you lost the job in uh, in Salt Lake City, there was a monetary settlement to yes. end your contract. Yeah. Well, in addition to the stigma attached to mental disorders, which which lingers, um, you're in the position of people, I'm sure, going, ah, now he has an excuse. Right. Well, and of, of course, you know, this isn't talked about that much because of the legal situations that could be. But there were uh, incredible problems with personnel who were like stealing things from my office, one of which was on my computer. That person may or may have not been the person who gave the quote in the New York Times. There were a lot of issues that were really bad that HR was aware of uh, and stressors. And really, when my stressors are activated to a certain degree, that's when the lying becomes that much more prolific and that much more present. So I wish that, your wife I wish your wife had been able to join us. Um, uh, how long have you guys been married? Uh, since 2013, so almost 10 years now. Okay. Um, have you lied to her throughout the entire marriage about things large and small? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's been it, simple as, I mean, and this is a lie that happened a long time ago and I'm not even sure where it came up, but like my birthday is in May, you know, I carried on for years that it was in September. I even, I made like um, a, a fake ID when I was in, or I got a fake ID. I didn't make it. I got a fake ID when I was underage, that was still underage so that I could just confirm that I was, you know, a birthday yeah. in September. I mean, that's For how no, absurd it is. Yeah, really. It's, it's completely, uh, it's completely, completely mm -hmm. baffling. Um, why do you suppose, why do you suppose she hung in with you? Are you just a lucky guy or? <laughs> I, I think, I think that's a big part. Um, but I, I, I love her very much. And I, I think she sees that, uh, she's seen how I've struggled with these things. Um, and that ultimately, I, I don't feel good about what I do. You know, it's it's first a buoy thing, but then there's almost immediately. And it's not like the um, it's not like, I guess, somebody who's doing it really with great intent where it's like, OK, I'm nervous so much after it's it's um, I like almost skip that. I go to shame and guilt and just like self-loathing. I can certainly understand that, but it would seem to me that the people around you, your wife in particular, but any prospective employers, uh, employees, employers, uh, or family members ha are, have uh, another problem regarding the unique nature of your lying, yeah. and which is since it's not tethered to anything 
that he's going to benefit from. If it is compulsive and pathological, um, how do we trust anything? Right. I mean, how, do we, how, how can we possibly be sure that when we ask him how he's doing, how you doing, Chris? How right. do we know he's telling us the truth? So it seems to me that you have the struggle of controlling your lying, which you say you, you, you struggle with still, but are doing better. But the, the other one is regaining trust. Do you think that'll ever fully come back, that trust factor? No, no, I don't. And that's, you know, I, I dug my own grave throughout this whole thing. You know, maybe it could have, uh, if, if I was able to get the help that would help identify this earlier on, I think maybe that could have been something that could have been completely avoided. Like if my parents actually went with any of these psychiatrists or psychologists, then I actually went through the methods. But um, yeah, no, I feel like I'm going to be to some degree uh, jaded, a bit of a pariah um, throughout my entire <laughs> existence. Um, I mean, I, I even talked with um, Ellen, the reporter at the time. She said, like, what do you want to get out of this? Do you think people are going to resonate with it. And I said, yeah, I think some people are going to resonate with it, but I don't think we're at a point in society where we're really taking it that seriously. And I don't think we're going to, because it's so tied to like negative behaviors. And well, this is a particularly tough one. I can tell you from years of interviewing and being and uh, interviewing lots of people who had uh, addiction uh, issues and mental health issues, the struggle with uh, uh, gaining uh, empathy from the broader Water group. It, it's not a character flaw. It's nothing to be ashamed of. It's a disease that that your situation is somewhat more difficult. I mean, yeah, it, it I, is it is much more difficult. People it, are going to hear this and go, "This is ridiculous." Yeah. Nobody wants to take responsibility for anything anymore. It's too easy to say, "I'm sick." Right. And look, for for what it's worth, I do take responsibility for this. You know. It's something I'm, I'm learning with how to deal with and how, how hopefully to course correct my life moving forward. But I mean, even, even saying that, Steve, even saying, you know, I have mental disorders and I'm taking responsibility for it. it it's, it's not enough. You know, the, the condemnation, the harassment, when we were in Salt Lake, I was getting death threats. I mean, that's how absurd it was. And I, I, well, I people, don't think, people don't like to be lied to it makes right. them feel foolish and they get angry. Yeah. Uh, Chris, uh, you know, I, I, I know, I know we said we'd keep you for only a little while. So I want to let, I want to let you go. I, I, I'd love to have you back in, in a year and, and see how the, uh, the control of the uh, line has held. I'll tell you this. And yeah, I know that the times reporter and any reporter and anyone that talks to you is going to, if they're honest, say to you, okay, just had a great conversation with this guy. I don't know if he's full of shit and just told me stories. Um, I will say this, that if uh, if this is your greatest, if this is just another Chris Massamine fable, another lie, it's it's the, grand, the grandest one you've come up with. And I just don't think, I prefer to believe it, this is honest. This is you bearing your soul saying, man, did I screw up? Uh, but if I'm wrong, and this is another story you've made up, you're good at this. You should start writing it down, but label it fiction. So we, we're all in on it. Good luck, right. man. Um, Thank uh, you. Uh, good luck. It's probably not uh, probably not going to be the easiest time of your life uh, right now. No, no. but I, I appreciate you having me on and, and talking about the conversation and hopefully a good amount of people, you know, pay attention and the conversation continues. That's really all I'm looking for these days. Well, I'll tell you this again, again, uh, taking what you say at face value, it takes a lot of guts to stand up uh, and, and do this. Whether you're telling the truth or not, it still takes a lot of guts to say I'm a liar and I'm trying to get better at it. Uh, uh, Christopher Massamine, uh, have a great holiday and we thank you for joining us on the Behavioral Corner. And uh, again, I will be, I'll be getting back to you because I want to, I want to check your progress. Uh, I wish you nothing but the best, my man. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Have a great holiday. You too. Okay, guys, thanks so much. Uh, Behavioral Corner, don't forget, please uh, push that subscription button, subscribe to the corner. And I'd love to hear your, re your reaction to Chris. I can, I can imagine what some of it's going to be, but I I'd still like to hear uh, your um, idea of whether lying can wind up being a mental disorder. Thanks. See you next time on the Behavioral Corner. 
Retreat Behavioral Health has proudly been serving the community for over 10 years. Here at Retreat, we believe in the power of connection and quality care. We offer comprehensive, holistic, and compassionate treatment from industry-leading experts. Call 855-802-6600 or visit us at www.retreatbehavioralhealth.com to begin your journey today. That's it for now. And make us a habit, hanging out at the Behavioral Corner. And when we're not hanging, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, on the Behavioral Corner.